is Jeff Smith, and I'm uh, on I'm on the Wharton Healthcare Program Alumni Association Board, as well as I'm president of the Mid Atlantic for Lamaris, and wanted to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules this morning. Have to say the the attendance uh, this morning has really just uh, exceeded our expectations. So many senior leaders in the room coming first thing with the weather threatening. We're just so pleased to have all of you here and have standing room only in the back. Uh, so just uh, just a few comments, and then I'll be turning the microphone over to Dan. Uh, as I mentioned, wanted to thank everyone for coming. Also, want to thank the panelists for agreeing to to speak on this event. Uh, Ralph for also being a special guest, and of course Dan for moderating uh, the event from LDI. Of course, I also want to thank Wharton and the LDI program for the, the sponsorship of this event and the presentation of the event overall. Uh, and so, just to kind of help set the stage, there's significant change underway today. So risk is being reallocated between payers, providers, and patients, which I think everybody in this room is probably feeling day in, day out. I think that the, the, the consequences of that is creating some real significant change in the overall business models for you all that are sitting in the, in the, the audience. We would, we would make the argument that the, the fee for value reimbursement is eclipsing fee for service. And you know, we heard at the beginning of the year that uh, HHS is looking to target 85% of the Medicare reimbursement being in value-based contracts by 2016, 90% by 2018. So this is a, a substantial change. Locally here, IBC has uh, contracts with health systems with over 90% penetration in their marketplace in the value-based contract. I think in terms of business model, uh, you know, Lumeris is an independent third-party operating partner with many of those on the stage. We have the privilege of working with them. I would just share with you that we have a, a close understanding of what's happening here in this marketplace as well as what's happening more broadly in the United States. And, and the, the point of view we have is that Philadelphia is actually becoming a reference model for the rest of the country. So many across the country are actually watching what's happening and going on today in Philadelphia because of the rapid change that's occurring. We're all familiar with what's happened in the West Coast, what's happened in the Northeast, but actually the, the rapid significant change underway in, in Philadelphia I think sets up an incredible dialogue and an incredible panel to have in front of us. So with that I know there's over 30 organizations represented here. As I mentioned, it's standing room only in the back. We're so pleased to have everybody. So with no uh, additional um, you know, taking of your time, I want to turn it over to Dan uh, to kick off the panel. Uh, before I uh, launch into the panel, I'll just give you a couple of brief words about what uh, LDI is, since we're one of the um, uh, co-sponsors of the event. Uh, so LDI is a, is a university-wide institute that brings together experts from all over campus uh, that do research or are involved in educational programs or want to push out policy um, related to uh, various aspects of uh, uh, transforming the healthcare system. It's really one of the things that we are uh, really dedicated to here at Penn. We have over 230 faculty that are connected to LDI and about 95 uh, fellows that are part of our institute. We've been around for almost 50 years, um, founded under this idea that uh, medicine really needed uh, management um, as a way to improve health of the country. And, and that vision from nearly 50 years ago couldn't be more present today. So when uh, Jeff and, and Jeff uh, from the Alumni Association and from Lumeris uh, came to me and asked me to um, run this panel, I was just uh, thrilled to do so and also just um, to have the opportunity to um, really raise the, the knowledge base in, in the region about what's going on in the area around population health and risk management just a tremendous opportunity uh, to be a part of this uh, part of this panel. Um, and with that, what I'd like to do is just give you a sense of how things are going to go today, and then introduce uh, the panelists. They're, they'll start out um, by introducing their their companies and what they've been up to uh, the past year, um, and then uh, just like five minute introductory remarks from each one of them, and then we'll launch into a panel discussion. Um, and then at, at the end of the discussion among the panelists, 
We are uh, uh, honored to have uh, Ralph Muller here today to uh, give his uh, remarks about uh, what, what he heard, and then we'll have a chance, um, and also not only remarks about what he heard, but just give a, a bigger picture, a sense of what, um, what we might expect going forward, and then uh, we can open it up, we'll leave uh, 25 minutes um, be our goal, um, to hear from this very knowledgeable uh, group in the room. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, introduce our panelists. Uh, we'll um, right uh, to the left, left of me here, uh, Susan Williams, who's the Chief Medical Officer of Noble Health Alliance. And um, Dr. Williams uh, is a, a physician, internal medicine physician, trained at Case Western Reserve. And uh, I'm happy to see here that she spent some time at the University of Pennsylvania, where she um, got her uh, fellowship in uh, internal medicine and nephrology. Um, and next to her is uh, Tony Coletta, who's the president and CEO of Candine Health. And he um, got his uh, medical training, unfortunately, at Thomas Jefferson <laughs> Medical College. <laughs> And has an MBA from, unfortunately, Fox School of Business at the Clinton University. And nevertheless, we are very excited to have him here with us. And uh, seated next to him is Sandra Gomberg, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Aria Health. And she served as the Chief Executive Officer and President of Temple University um, Hospital, Inc., where she was. Um, uh, a member of the leadership team there for more than 13 years. She has a master's in nursing administration and an adjunct associate professor at Temple University School of Medicine. I'll stop picking on non pen uh, <laughs> allegiances. Um, but we are also thrilled to have her. So uh, we have a really terrific uh, panel here today. And um, I think I'll uh, turn it over uh, and we'll start to hear some intro remarks before we uh, launch into a discussion. And, Susan, why don't you start with you? Good morning. Hi. Anne says, I'm Susan Williams, and I'm from um, Noble Health Alliance. Um, Noble represents, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Noble represents three health systems, originally four, um, ARIA, uh, Einstein Health Network, and Crozier Keystone Health System. Uh, the systems came together to form an FTC-compliant, clinically integrated network. Uh, chose clinical integration as a vehicle because it's, it's been <coughs> successful in other markets as a uh, vehicle for population health management. And we believe, as I'm sure most of everyone in the room does, that to be successful in a world of risk-based or value-based contracting, population health is a skill that is uh, really needed. Um, Noble's uh, was brought up in three phases. The first phase um, involves uh, developing the skill, the physician engagement, and the infrastructure needed to successfully manage a population. Our initial population are, are 27,000 employees and their dependents. It's Noble's intention long term to manage a much larger attributed population, but we're learning the skills on that population. We're going to take our success in that and market directly to employers um, and partner with payers around uh, putting special noble products into the market. Uh, we have an all-payer strategy, so we are not tied to one payer and are in conversation working with several at the current time. Um, as we come up, we are participating in upside-only contracts, but we'd like to quickly move through that stage and get to where we are accepting global risk, because I think that's probably the way to be successful long-term. To date, uh, we've brought up a physician network of 2,200 physicians. Um, uh, 552, I just looked at this this morning, are primary care physicians, of which 200 are independent and the others are employed by the member health systems. Um, <clears throat> we've brought up a, spent a great deal of time on a searchable directory website, which uh, makes it easy for our employees, but also our offices to search to find noble providers lists their specialties, their interests, et cetera. Our employee health plan across Noble went live January 1, um, and we've got tiering in effect. 
uh, so, which will is is driving business into our um, member health systems. Uh, clinical integration involves um, there's a great deal. It demands uh, intense physician participation and governance. We have established Noble Physician Partners, which is a subsidiary corporation of Noble Health Alliance, which is entirely physician run, 10 member uh, physician board. And with our quality credentialing and uh, finance committees under that is how we manage the clinical enterprise of Noble. So far, we've got quality governance in place, got metrics, we've done procedures around due process and have developed a distribution model for a shared savings program, uh, which should be coming up in July, which will be coming up in July. Over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we want to continue to build out care management. We have about 50% of our care management staff in place. As Tony and I were talking earlier, this is a lot more difficult than it seems at the start, so we will be doing that over the next, uh, uh, to uh, refining that and building out over the next 12 to 18 months. We also have started engaging physicians, but will continue to, to aggressively um, engage physicians. Our data reporting, we went live um, this week, actually, and so again, in the next year, we need to see regular reports coming out that are not just, not, don't just exist, but are actually being reviewed and, and we're acting on them, and that will be a goal as well. So. Good morning, everybody. Um, even though I trained at Jeff and got my MBA at Temple, I think I've spent more time on the Penn campus this year than I have anywhere else. <laughs> so you got to realize what it's like to be sitting here and have Ralph Muller there taking notes while we talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he gets the last shot, right? So, uh, but it's it's really 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 good to be here. I always be, enjoy being on the Penn campus and and uh, work with LDI because there's so many uh, really exciting, interesting. Uh, smart people that are what we're all trying to row in the same direction just with different strategies so um, so I'm a general surgeon by trade um, then about three or years or so ago my cell phone rang and it was uh, Dan Hilferty people say why are you in this business I say well Dan Hilferty called me <laughs> and uh, and basically he said in, in so many words that um, independence so they now call them independence health group they, they've got a problem in Philadelphia in that to manage care as we once knew it has sort of come to the end of its functional business life cycle right it started out with, as one strategy and it's evolved basically into really as much policing care as it is managing care you know you can policing utilization and in this market in Philadelphia it turns out to be one of the most expensive healthcare markets in the most expensive healthcare country in the world so there, there was there's a problem here the managed care model coming at the end of its uh, business life cycle and he said can you can help us uh, create what they called at the time a, a physician centric strategy I'm like right, what does that really mean and you know what what's involved and why a physician centric strategy and so anyway I, um, we started on this journey that eventually became Tandem Health and as we wrote the business plan um, we picked some lanes the first lane that we picked. Uh, was to be uh, our physician centric strategy was to be primary care centric we just picked that lane right uh, as a starting point uh, because our value proposition is that there are no customers we or stakeholders in the healthcare system better positioned to create value which is to increase quality while lower cost than than primary care physicians and in this market in many ways they had been sort of marginalized it's a market that's uh, heavily hospital and specialist driven so there was an opportunity to uh, help them understand the kind of uh, influence they can have on the care of their patients and creating value, improving the system overall. So we picked uh, this physician-centric strategy was became uh, primary care-centric. That was the lane that we picked. And we also decided that if we're going to move into this, this um, model, we would jump in with both feet. So we wanted to move into global, full global risk as quickly as we possibly could. And uh, of course, having independence, uh, the insurer, with a lot of their influence, uh, their understanding of managing risk and aggregating premiums, and that would be a, that's a great partner to have to begin with if you're going to enter into a risk agreement with a partner in this market. Uh, but then we also went out and sought an, uh, a second partner, so uh, Davida Healthcare Partners, Healthcare Partners Division of Davida, really is in essence the largest independent physician group in the country. In the aggregate, they manage over 800,000 patients, mostly Medicare patients, but other, otherwise commercial in six states. 
And they have models in other markets that demonstrate that coordinated care, uh, which really uh, needs to be developed in this market especially, can actually lower costs and improve quality of, of the patient's life by uh, devoting resources to the patients who need them the most and rewarding physicians appropriately for the care that they deliver. And they've demonstrated that it worked. And then, long story short, this became Tandime Health. 50% uh, owned by DeVita Healthcare Partners, 50% owned by Independence Blue Cross. Uh, exclusive to Independence Blue Cross for two more years. And after 2000, the end of 2017, Tandime Health has the ability to be multi-payer. Still owned 50% by Independence, but um, you know, the way that went is healthcare partners wanted us to be multi-payer on day one. Independence was like, do you ever really have to be multi-payer? <laughs> and uh, so we came to the agreement that it would be a three-year exclusive agreement. We're into our second year now. We, we stood the company up about a year ago. Um, we have 355 primary care physicians in all five counties who have signed uh, provider agreements for three years. The vast majority are independent primary care practitioners. They bring with them 92,000 attributed lives that are IBC either fully insured commercial HMO patients or IBC Medicare Advantage patients. So when these doctors sign, uh, that creates our population. And on January 1st, uh, we began the first of five year full risk agreement with Independence Blue Cross <coughs> uh, at full risk for the cost and quality of care to manage those 92,000 patients. Um, and our, our, the principles behind the company are primary care doctors are our customers. So we now have about 55 employees. About a year ago, there were one and a half of us. So there's very rapid growth. And um, we, we are, we're out to engage, enable, and empower those primary care physicians to take better care of these patients in such a way that they can stay healthy, stay out of the hospital if they don't need to be in the hospital. And when they need to be in the hospital or need to be in the hands of the specialist, they're in the right, right hands where there's value being created which is you know, the, the equation of cost and quality, not just cost and or quality. So we've got 92,000 patients. We're four months into the risk agreement. It's a very, very complicated business, full risk. Uh, as a CEO, I'm learning that every single day. I eat, sleep, and drink the, the environment right now. Um, it's very uncertain in the beginning when you go at full risk because you don't have all the data. There's, there's always a 90-day lag between when costs are incurred and when you're actually seeing them on the books and um, so there are a lot of moving parts uh, but we feel that directionally we're moving in the, in the right direction. Have one health system deal already in place or working on a second and our intent is, I was telling Ralph earlier, is that um, and we've had great discussions with Aria and talked to Noble as well but if, if we can find partners that can help us create value, they should, our feeling is they should share in the value. It's, it, it, no, nobody should be entitled uh, to, to, the, to get paid for things. If we're creating value, then we believe the best model out there is to share in that, in that value. So we are looking to do more relationships, help shape the market in such a way that we all recognize that it's a great place to deliver medicine. It's a, we have these highly valued institutions and um, find ways to be able to share in that value beyond just uh, with our primary cares, who are the key constituents to this. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am from Aria Health System. Aria is a three hospital health system located in the northeast corridor of Philadelphia and Lower Bucks County. It's about a $700 million um, enterprise that also has a physician company and a home care company. And um, I want to talk about our kind of journey in thinking about this more in the macroeconomics uh, section. So when we were actually prepping for this as a, a nurse and a hospital executive, I started to talk to, about economics to Daniel, then realized he actually does economics. So <laughs> it was, um, I had to like pull it back a little bit. So he's, he's promised not to check me on the supply and demand curve. But um, nonetheless, um, about two years ago, maybe a little bit longer, um, as the payers started to come to us as providers and say, hey, listen, um, we're going to give you 2% less, but we're going to put all this money in a bucket, and you can earn it back if. And the payers kind of naively started to pick quality metrics that they thought would be good for them, um, increase their kind of revenue capture, but were really hard for us to try to capture and even harder for us to manage or even care about on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And Ariel, like all of our colleagues out there, many of you in the room, um, jumped into that boat because it was really how the contracting process was going. One of the um, and, you know, kind of drivers in the market was IBC's construct around their pay for value program that allowed us to partner and gain share with doctors. And um, under the federal law, you got to do that in, in a really specific way. And so we, like all the other hospitals who engaged in that contract, set up a separate little LLC um, to make it compliant to bring money in from shared savings and then dole it out to either the hospital or the doctors. And so we jumped in that boat with everybody else. Um, as we took a step back and looked at the strategy of the economics of where we were going as a health system and where health systems, particularly in the Philadelphia market, are going, we realized that we had to think about this very differently. Um, for the last 120 years, we, like other hospitals, have been set up to um, open up the um, supply, I mean the demand gates, and supply gates and get paid for all comers. So the more that came to us, the more we got paid. It was great. The more ER visits, that meant the more admissions, the more visits to the doctors, and we got paid on the each. By taking, trying to do a budget on a $700 million book of business and say, great news to your CFO, we're gonna get $100 million less in revenue, but we can earn it back here in 18 to 24 months. Um, it, it just doesn't resonate like that. And so we literally had to take the time to fundamentally take apart the economics of how we ran the hospital. Exactly how much money did we need to bring in? Um, exactly what is our, our kind of minimal cost structure? Could we live on that Medicare diet um, and how could our internal operating mechanism and our partnership with doctors change to allow us to go at risk and bring dollars in at a, at a future date? The CFO calls that revenue replacement. Um, so one of our biggest challenges was getting the CFO and the finance staff to kind of drink that Kool-Aid and to be willing to take that what I'll call operational risk about changing that economic model before we were ready to take risk, full risk from the insurance companies. Um, fast forward to today, uh, we have 50,000 attributed lives that are not our employees, because Susan's got our employees. Um, so there are 50,000 uh, patients. They are from um, only about 43 of our PCPs. The rest are PCPs in the market that are otherwise unaffiliated with us less these pair of um, arrangements. In there is everything from full risk Medicaid and Medicaid, um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid managed care, um, full risk around another payer population on a Medicare book of business, and then pay for value or pay for performance from other major commercial carriers. So really a multi-payer um, construct around the patient population. One last piece, um, when you're a community hospital, you really live and die by the work that comes from your primary care doctors. ARIA is in a unique situation based on the Philadelphia market, as my colleagues have mentioned, in the sense that 70% of all of our business comes from doctors that we don't own, employ, or otherwise have any arrangement with, which is a little scary. Um, the, the upside is, whoo, it's bigger business for us to get. The downside is, holy macaroni, is Tony gonna sway him? <laughs> um, is he gonna start redirecting my business? Um, is somebody else gonna start redirecting my business on that PCP construct? On any given day in our hospital, over 30% of the patients are on private doctor services, not employed hospitalists, not in that model that has really kind of taken hold in other parts of the market. So, so that constructive ambiguity around the change in the economic model on fee-for-service, that changing the operations fundamentally in the physician company in the hospital to be able to, excuse me, think about being ready for that risk, and then jumping into that risk boat with a lot of people that we don't know um, really has created our place in where we are with population health. I think what we'll start with uh, just an opening question, and like all you just to maybe comment briefly on it, is uh, you know what I guess you know what were your goals going in, and you kind of touched on that along the way. But I guess what I'm interested in learning is uh, you know how that has shifted since you. I imagine just by starting this uh, process, you're learning so much along the way. So did you have an initial goal that said, "Gee, you know, I really 
you know, bringing value uh, to the system seems like something I need to go in on. And then how, has, how, how have your goals uh, shifted as you've kind of uh, entered into this learning process? Um, I'd be interested in getting some comments on that. Sure. Um, well, our goals going probably weren't much different than anyone else's. We, clearly, healthcare is changing. We are now need to be about quality and cost if we're going to do well, and this was a vehicle to do that. We wanted to get out in front and, and do well. So that was our that was our goals going in. I can't say the goal has shifted. Um, some of the way we're going about it has shifted. Um, I, I certainly would place a greater emphasis on, at, at the end of the day, we can all build uh, boards and infrastructure and this and that, but at the end of the day, it's about changing care. It's about changing how we, fundamentally, how we deliver care, and that involves uh, clinicians and, you know, whether nurses, doctors, and, um, Bringing them to the table earlier, um, I think, would, would be something that I would be more focused on going for it forward rather than all of this, this board, that committee, these metrics, whatever. So I think that's where our goals, I don't, I don't think the goals shifted, but maybe how we're, how we're making that goal happen has changed a bit. Well, I'll go back to um, my, I didn't, don't remember everything from my MBA, but I do remember um, uh, something called a big ass hairy goal. <laughs> and, uh, and we still have that. We, Tandime is a pure, simple startup. Uh, we, we, we believe in the fact that we're a disruptor in the marketplace in a good way. Um, and we have this big ass hairy goal, which is to uh, restore and maintain balance in the healthcare ecosystem. We just think it's out of balance. I um, mean, there are many reasons as to why it's out of balance, but it's, it's out of balance. We, we're a sick care system as much as we are a healthcare system in the United States. And so our big ass hairy goal is to restore and maintain balance uh, back into the healthcare system, which, meet, which in our, in our uh, business plan and in our strategy means putting the primary care physician, uh, the patient and the family back in the center of the equation. That's the first step to restoring balance. And in our world, and in my world, that, that big ass hairy goal doesn't change. And in fact, uh, we talk about it every Friday morning at the Tandime Huddle at 8 o'clock. We all get, everybody gets out from behind their cubicles uh, and we just talk about the fact that that's what we're in this to do. And it helps to create a purpose in the reason why people come and work at Tandime every day because we all feel like we're moving in the right direction. We're doing the right thing. Um, now, beyond the big ass hairy goal, uh, what we learned in the, in the 14 months that we've been up and running, and I mentioned previously, is that operationally, this is a really, really, really complicated business. And I thought nine or 12 months was enough to be ready to go at full risk. It's really not, actually. I mean, I, we're, we're in a responsible position. We have a good risk contract that helps to protect uh, the, us at the outset in terms of as we grow in our model. But the, the moving, the million moving operational parts everywhere from uh, building a sales force of physician liaisons who go out into the practices and help them understand how to use the Lumeris tool, which is, you know, that's the enablement piece, to building the, the empowerment, which is, we say engage, enable, empower. Empowerment is uh, that community-based delivery system that doesn't really exist much in the Philadelphia market. It's that delivery of care between the emergency room and the doctor's office. It's all those things that could happen at the community-based level to enhance the care and support the care of these, especially for the chronically ill. Building that business model and getting it to a spot where you can see it uh, two decades, three decades old in Southern California and trying to get there in a couple of years. Um, when you talk, talk about operating goals, it's like it's a day-to-day -day, uh, focus on all the details that are associated with a startup. But we won't ever leave our big ass hairy goal of restoring, trying to restore and maintain balance once we get there. And, and can you add to that uh, just on the, on the timelines? Like when do you think um, you, you're like running on all cylinders achieving some of the, the value that you know, you're looking to? Wow, um, I don't know if you ever really exactly defined that in a, in a completely evolving economic model, but um, I would say as a, as a healthcare provider, it, it probably took that 18 to 24 months to really understand what all of that meant um, and 
looking forward. I'm not sure where I could predict when it's going to be done. What, what I will tell you is that you've got to watch for key milestones along the way. Um, because it's not so much the timing as the milestones. And so the, I think the first milestone is recognizing that from the provider standpoint, you have an obligation to sustain your organization and serve the community that you have. Like that, that's your number one goal. So that is get every stinking dollar from every value-based contract and stuff it in the bank. And so, so that was our first goal. But when you look at the time horizon, um, recognizing that you need to change your relationship with payers, so, so that's one big milestone in your, in your timeline, because you can't go in anymore and be combative and argue about rates. It is a very, very different discussion, and there is at least three or four um, uh, payers who I was among the most wanted um, on a bulletin board that I had to become their BFFs. Um, by the time we did a very complicated risk contract. And so, so that's a, a milestone that tells you you're going in the right direction. Um, and then I think the third major milestone that you recognize as a provider is that you have lurched your primary care doctors into the front of the bus um, and you need to start thinking about investing in them like you used to think about investing in the operating room. And that's a really hard milestone to swallow when you are a non, generally a non-primary care centric enterprise and whether that physician group needs to be run differently or somebody else needs to do it or you need to get out of the way um, that's I think the next big milestone to know you're on the right track so I would just add to on the on the time frame thing from a startup standpoint you know we we we, um, we went to both owners with a five-year pro forma uh, so it, there was a five was a five-year business pro forma built on bending the cost curve a little bit in the beginning. This is basically the economics of it, uh, and then a little bit more in the second year and third year, and and then out five years. That was the original pro forma. We're in the midst of uh, refreshing that whole entire business plan. And two years old, it it needs to be refreshed because the demand in the marketplace was far greater than we expected it to be. But we had in the worst case, expected case, and best case scenarios in the pro forma, and we had a a two and a half year. Um, a timeline from when we first started, April of last year, that if we were in the worst case scenario, we were going to we would shut it down. I mean, the owners want to cut their losses, right? It's a it, it's a forty million dollar investment these owners have in the first two years of building the infrastructure to go at risk. So it's not for the faint of heart. But you know, they were they they would they asked me quite out. You know, if you if in two and a half years. You know, you're in the worst case scenario. What are you doing? And I'll say, well, I'll probably go back to taking out gallbladders again or something. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, but so now and we for we, service. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do create value. Yeah. I think I have the best outcome because I work with the sickest patients, right? So. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that. Um, is you know in in something like this you've got to have sort of a if if after three years or so you're not beginning to show some effect to bend the cost curve in a full risk environment you won't be in the full risk business unless you have uh, you, unless you have an unending appetite for for financial loss um, and you know most systems don't have that these days and most companies don't so. So from a time frame perspective, you know, we were looking at two and a half years. Thankfully, we're in many ways in the best case scenario now. Uh, so we're now mapping out the next, what the next three and a half years will look like. Can't go much past that, I don't think. So I hear, you know, so I'm a tenured professor, you know, I can't get fired here unless I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna test it. Um, but, like, you know, there's so little risk that I have to, you know, endure, and, and just hearing the three of you talk about this, uh, this, you know, uh, startup uh, uh, mentality of, you know, of pursuing this uh, five-year goal, or, or the risks just around cash flow, uh, uh, to to feel like you're on the winning end of that risk, like what are the, like what's the thing that keeps you up at night, like what's the biggest uh, challenge ahead of you? Um, for uh, feeling like uh, you know you may may have that tenure professor low risk life uh, ahead of you, um, and I imagine it's not just you know the risk you're bearing on your contracts, but um, you know it, it seems to be multi-dimensional. I don't know if you you want to start because when you were talking, I was getting like palpitations. Yeah. Just by the risk. <laughs> so I take Dramamine <laughs> <Okay. laughs> instead of vitamins. Um, <laughs> 
You know, I think the thing that keeps me up at night is continuously weighing what part of this business should we be in as providers or shouldn't we be in as providers. Because what we don't want to do as providers is completely replicate a care management enterprise that already didn't work in an insurance company. Like, that's cuckoo. I want to take the risk, and then I'm going to replicate it. That doesn't make any sense. And so as a community hospital entity whose real goal is to sustain the local community and focus on primary care, we know we've got to be in this in some way. Um, but should I really be having, you know, 65, 100,000 at-risk lives? And is, is that the right role for us to invest in? Should that be separate or together? Should we partner? Should we not partner? Um, and, and that is going to evolve for every single health system in any market. And it's going to be different for everybody. And that, I think, is, makes this an even more ambiguous conversation. We've lived through healthcare where we all generally did the same thing. We all have generally had the same strategic plans. We want more market share, it's around the same five service lines, we're gonna put up different access points. You could take our books and share them around, it was all about the execution. Now, each of us don't have that book and we can each function very differently. And when you're the executive and you're going to a board and this is even more foreign to them and trying to decide where you put your finite resources particularly when you need to take more and more risk. That's, that's fundamentally what keeps me up at night. What about you? I would say essentially the, the same. I'm going to phrase it a little differently. Um, I go back, what keeps me up at night is we're putting in an infrastructure that Tony mentioned 40 million, in our case it's 20 million, very expensive infrastructure. And can we do it? I mean, so we put in this whole infrastructure, but can we really change how we deliver the care? Um, mentioned replicating care management. I, I have a fundamental belief that care management does belong on the provider side and not on the payer side, so I'm committed to that. But, uh, but again, it's resources and you're thinking all the time, at the end of the day, can we do this? Crozier, which is one of our member health systems, has have been aggressive with their employees for the last year and a half, and I'm pleased to say actually has bent the cost curve there, so that makes me feel like, okay, maybe we are on the right track, but it is constantly weighing the investment, again, what you believe will be the outcome, but we're, we're not there yet, and it, you know, year, two years, whatever, so that's what keeps me in the I, 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 well. I just don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the, one of one of the biggest challenges is to uh, shake the the uh, Independence Blue Cross uh, brand. We have to we we're not we're not Independence Blue Cross. Uh, fit, they own 50 percent of us. They're you know they're three uh, very great members of our board, but it, it's a separate company, a separate brand for a reason. So when we're out there talking to primary care doctors, our customers, you know, uh, hospitals and doctors in all markets all over the country have you know, this sort of doctor versus hospital versus pl health plan mentality, and we have to shake that because we are not a health plan. And there are times when I need to shake the people that work for me and say, you, we're acting like a health plan. You're gonna put more forms in front of these customers? What are you, just another health plan, you know? And they tell me, hopefully, that I, like, go to the shore, Tony, go. <laughs> but the point is, is that we have to, we have to uh, create uh, a brand that's clearly the primary care doctors are our customers, and we're not, we're not a health plan. We're not, the, we're not the conventional managed care plan. Um, so creating that that aura and understanding that we're trying to create a new experience for these primary care physicians and for their patients. I think the second thing that, uh, that has come up recently on my radar screen is the fact that we believe in the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, we deeply believe that. I mean, that's how I spent 25 years of my life uh, in the operating room. But I think there's a real risk that, um, that technology, mobile platforms, digital health, um, you will find ways to engage uh, patients, health plans will call them members, in ways that could potentially leave our traditional, tradition meets innovation behind. You know, tele, telemedicine, telehealth, increase access for patients to see any doctor or any provider whenever they need them, wherever they need them, what do I need my primary care doctor for kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think we need to stay on top of that. And I, I think Tandem needs to actually embrace it. 
all the time embracing that while trying to just stand up the basic uh, building blocks of being of, uh, of a full risk managed services organization. So we have to, on the one hand, be ahead of the curve. We're first move, trying to be first movers in this in this business model. But there are clearly disruptors out there that are going to say, "That's fine, Tony. You engage enable and empower your primary care doctors. We're going to put mobile platforms in the hands of all these consumers, and they'll find ways to get health care with or without you." And uh, that's I think there's a real real risk for that uh, that we need to, we need to stay ahead of. Um, so I'd like to turn a little bit to some of the the details. Um, talk about some experiences and lessons learned, but. Um, before I do, I guess you know our topics here are physician engagement, organizational structure, data, and culture. So among those four, just before we jump into you know kind of take them one by one, you know which one do you see as you know the most um, you know the highest priority? Well, I'll start. Uh, for Tandem, it's uh, absolutely it's it's culture for the company. I mean, all of you who work for organizations, I think everyone understands and knows how important the culture is. It is, and, and so get, you know, ag growing quickly with new employees, engaging doctors who don't really know us, they have to understand, you know, our culture. Uh, and at the essence of our culture, you know, is, um, you know, I try and create an environment of what I call positive deviance. You know, we don't want to just we, be profitable. We think we're on the verge of an enterprise that could create abundance and improve access by being more than just profitable. You know, it's the story of Rocky Flats. I don't know if anybody's heard that story, uh, that nuclear wasteland uh, outside of Denver that everybody thought it was going to take 60 years and $60 billion to clean up, and they did it in about 10 years for $30 billion um, by, by creating a, an understanding that they weren't, and, and then actually what became not just nuclear wasteland is now a wildlife refuge. They didn't just want to clean it up, they wanted to create a wildlife refuge. And so we're trying to create the culture inside Tandem and hopefully it'll, be, it'll grow to the, to, out to, the, to our constituents that we're not just in the business of trying to be a successful risk manager. We want to we wanna change the, the, the landscape in Philadelphia of patients that have been at the receiving end of, of fragmented care for two or three decades and we want to create health and wellness and well-being. We just don't want to be a profitable um, uh, business. So we're, we're, I think culture is at the center of it and if you live and breathe the culture uh, I, I believe that primary care doctors, the health systems we, we start to work with are going to actually see that, that, uh, that it's a culture that is has a purpose, and and so I really think it's at the center of changing behavior. Um, since Tony picked culture, I won't pick cul pick culture. Um, <laughs> Joey, because, uh, no, don't. Um, and, and I think I've already talked a little bit about about that. Well, the one I, I think I'll pick is um, engagement, and with the um, with the doctors. Um, you know, as Tony's um, mentioned and Susan has mentioned, you know, Philadelphia is a very unusual market. You know, we don't have large independent physician associations. And, and that's why the payers are having a hard time. The, the Cygnus, the Aetnas, the United, they're having a very hard time in our market because they're used to going to big groups like Tony's group and making a negotiated arrangement and that doctor group being very engaged and driving the, bit, excuse me, driving the business and lowering costs as appropriate. We, we own our doctors or their employee in this market, and we have lots of health system run or employee physician groups still. And if they're not in that model, they're all little independents, some of them gathering in clumps or pods officially or unofficially, largely around certain payer groups. And so it's, it, you know, Tony's guys signed up on purpose. They signed in on purpose. They, they bought into his model. Um, they get paychecks from him. That's not how it is in most of the other primary care groups out there that we have to um, engage in order to bend the cost curve to get them to do stuff differently. And, and fundamentally, as a nurse, as, as much as the, uh, my physician colleagues, I fully agree that the change has to happen at the point of contact where the PCP has the patient in front of him or her. And this whole crap about us having case managers and, and, and liaisons running around in practices, if, you, if you've got five different payers, you have five different liaisons in your practice as a primary care doctor. That's ridiculous. 
Um, they all have different papers to fill out. They, they fundamentally aren't going to be able to do their job. So recognizing how that PCP needs to do his or her work and engage them at that point and understand how our role is different, I think is the, is the kind of linchpin of pushing the model forward. Um, and so I come at it from a different angle, but, but Tony and I have similar parallel um, alignment around that. So going through it, I have I the know, advantage I, I of agreeing with both. So um, I, mean, I think we all agree that culture is the, pretty much the center of what, of what we do. Um, and and uh, springing from that culture is the, the engagement piece. We, you know, we, we tend to be, these models tend to be primary care centric, and so we're talking about primary care physicians, um, engaging them through, uh, through dollars, through education, through support and care management. There's a whole other piece that's the, much as we love primaries, we can't practice without specialists. And that's a, there are many more specialists than there are primaries, and that's a whole other group that, that has to be engaged. And in these models, again, they tend to reward primary care. So engaging a specialist by saying, well, actually, your business is going down, but come on down and join us is not always a, a, <laughs> not always a winner out of the gate. So um, working with specialists, again, this goes back to culture to understand that fundamentally we need to change healthcare and we'd like for them to be a part of it. That, that is a, a task as well. So I'll, I'll agree with both of them. I would put data, uh, data, no, not, no offense to any data people in the room, but IT is an imperfect science, always will be. We, as soon as you get data, you want more, better data. So you've just got to go in saying, look, this is the data we have. It's not perfect. We recognize that, and we'll continue to refine. So I would put that down the list. So, and I just want to, I would want to add to what Tanya was talking about, because I saw some of my primary care customers in the audience shaking their heads, and they say, oh, yeah, five different payers, five different ways of doing things. and. Uh, one of the advantages that Tandem has because of Independence Blue Cross being a partner is that is because of their, the fact that they're a strong insurance company in this marketplace, uh, each, on average, each primary care doctor that has signed into a Tandem arrangement brings with him or her 200 of these fully insured commercial Keystone patients and around 50 IBC Medicare Advantage patients. So 250 patients on average per doc. It's not all their practice. It's 10%, maybe 15%. but because of the way traditionally they've been reimbursed in this marketplace, which is awful, um, if we could get another 20 or 30 or $40,000 into their hands based on their performance, <clears throat> you, you've taken 10% of their practice and created a whole new big chunk of their revenue, a much higher percentage of their income could come from that smaller population. So boom, you have their attention. And if we don't have it yet, it, because we trip over things and we're not getting it all in place, we will as they start to see the way that mo economically, because you know, we can't deny the fact that, uh, that, that economics are involved here, and you know, people get paid to do the right thing, and if they expect to get paid more, they do more. Um, but that, you know, being able to get that first mover advantage and, be, uh, and have them direct their attention to the Tandem patient management as part of all of this, um, and then have them see a significant part of their revenue be associated with a of even just 10 to 15 percent of the patient population. And I think the final thing to add is that 355 docs, primary care docs, 500, you mentioned 500 uh, independent and employed, uh, a number that you guys have. When, if you think about their panels, it's 2,000 patients or so per doc. So 355 primary care doctors may have 92,000 tandine patients at risk, but together in the aggregate, they manage 700,000 patients across the five counties. And when you start to get that message to them, and they start to see where value goes in tandem, I think they're, they're, they, uh, the other referral for, for, for patterns will change as well. Just whoever the payer is. If they start to see value, good quality care at, at the right cost in the tandem environment, that they, they control 700,000 patients. They can control, and that, that, so they get, you empower them uh, with a sense of what their influence could really be. So you're, you're talking about the disruptive nature of what you're doing, that they would then try to get risk-based contracts for the other part of their panel? Well, it, you know, there's, it's, it's gonna be a long journey from, a, this is a pure fee-for-service market, really, when you look at the, regardless of where everybody thought they were along the managed care timelines, over the last two decades, it's a so to get to a point where the majority of their patients are in full risk arrangements will take 
a significant period of time. But if you can show them that actually uh, with the right partners and the right tools and the right incentives, you can be, you can be, you can have a profitable business in the business of, of, of managing risk-based contracts and letting somebody else take the risk for you, uh, that I think they're going to get it very quickly. I mean, they're, they're astute business people. The independent primary care doctors, the guys, the men and women that lead those practices, they see where every dime goes. And these are, a lot of these practices are big practices. And they, you know, the economics will, is gonna, will be clear over time. So I, I'd like to pick up on something that, that you said, Sandra, which is that, you know, it's different if you're going to the docs and saying, you know, who wants to join me? Um, where you can, the ones that opt in might be the ones that uh, are more likely to be receptive versus just plopping it down in your health system and everyone has to behave a certain way. So, you know, rather than this model, you know, this single type of provider or single type of PCP provider, there are many types. And so, um, you know, you mentioned some, all of you mentioned some strategies, but I guess the, the, the bigger question in my mind that comes up from what you said is, you know, is it something that all docs could do or some just going to be better at it and, and it should be segmented and allow docs to sort themselves into the model that works for them? Well, at the, at the really big macro system, I think we're all going to sort ourselves out into a model, whether it's individual doc groups or health systems, because we're all not going to do this the same way. Um, whatever Ralph's going to do at Penn is going to look very different than what a community system like Ari is going to do, and, and that's okay. We have to get used to, right now in healthcare, a lot of constructive <coughs> ambiguity and different flavors of how we do it at the macro level. When, you, when I look at it from a health system level, or I'll say um, a partnership with attributed docs and owned docs, the, the key thing through all of this is it is all of those contracts generally boil down to the same half a dozen, maybe a dozen actions or exchanges that happen at the point of service. And so it's having the right information in the hands of the doc when the patient's there. It's having the pre-visit planning fixed up so when the people who do the stuff before the doc gets the patient do it in such a way that the doc can do it in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it's about getting real-time or as close to real-time data and feedback back to the physician and it's enabling them to get the right data to the payer at the right time so they can glean that money um, back from the payers, whether it's completing physicals or 360 degree evaluations or you know, sending me for my 50-year-old colonoscopy, whatever it is, um, being able to do that in a way that makes them not have to do more work and so they can treat each patient the same. To Tony's point, it's very hard for me to look one of our employee PCPs or even affiliated PCPs in the face and say, can you do this for your six Bravo patients and this for your 20 IBC patients? So we have to create that infrastructure. And it, it all, this, this whole pay for performance thing is coalescing around a couple of buckets. So whether we help them use technology enablers, which, which really to Susan's point has to be multi-payer, we, we can't do Aetna's technology and Blue Cross technology and Cigna technology. It has to be a multi-payer platform that allows us to bring that doc, that doc the, what they need, and then we need the operating structure to do it. And so it, it, on one hand, the physicians have to do some of this because it's their revenue replacement. It's their money that they already aren't getting paid for work they're doing because we have evolved fee-for-service to kind of mini pay for value. Um, now, whether or not they jump into a full risk arrangement, that, that might be forced by who they get a paycheck from, and Tony certainly has the early adopters. Um, but that fundamental approach to the way you, you manage a primary care group it has to happen. So it's like the, the docs, uh, the, the financial changes are forcing their hand one way or another. Well, so I would, I would take the position that whether employed or not, it's all driving the same. When you say sort out, there's not really room at this point for not sorting into high quality and low cost. So however you sort that out, you got to wind up there or I don't think you'll be successful going forward. On the employed side, 
probably yeah, later adopters because they get a paycheck and because they don't really deal with back office, although increasingly compensation models are changing to, to whether you're employed or, or independent to reflect quality, costs, et cetera. So. And, and I think, like anything else, there's always this bell-shaped curve. Um, so with, even with primary care doctors, there's going to be docs that just have had it, they're just not doing that, you know, just it's, you know, enough's enough. And there'll be others that'll be geeks and love this stuff mm -hmm. and see it and, you know, wake up and the first thing they turn on in the morning is Lumeris. And, and then there'll be others that are going to migrate in one direction or the other on the, the bell-shaped curve. Uh, in our model, for the docs that sign in, the ones that can't or don't or aren't able to do all the other things, uh, tan, it, Tandime's intention to do it for them, for the management of their patients, for the good of their patients and communicate with them. So they don't have to do it all. Now on the specialist side though, I think there's a difference. And, um, and I think every, and I'm a specialist, we're, you know, I mean, speak openly about this. We all know that we're not all created equal. Uh, you go talk to any anesthesiologist in any operating room, <laughs> And they'll tell you who this, they would want to have operate on them because they watch it every day. Now they make it all get paid the same, and some of them, you know, it's available, affable, and able. Some of them may have big practices, but they are not all created equal. I mean, PJ Brennan's here, and PJ knows there's a number of times I've reached out to him the last couple of years and said, PJ, I need, can you give me the name of the very best guy for this thing, a head injury or something, you know, because we know that we, there's a concentration of the very best in certain specialties in, in many of these academic institutions, but they are not all created equal. And so I think in, on the specialist side, this is really gonna shake out. And, um, the, and the, the, the best, who provide the best care, the best outcomes at the right price, which includes site of service, uh, those are gonna be the ones that'll really be the winners. Now the others may continue to work in the marketplace, they don't have to uproot and move out, but I, we do believe that there's gonna be a, uh, a, a more narrow network of, of the most superior specialists providing services in the marketplace. And I, I think that, that's, uh, that has to happen. Dean, can, we, can I follow that with about leakage for a second? Um, one of the newer kind of supply and demand looking curves that's up on my wall um, has to do with uh, leakage and engagement, right? Leakage goes this way, engagement goes that way. Um, and so one of the things that we're each talking about is keepage or leakage, you know, getting um, an attributed group of doctors to keep an attributed group of patients in some n more narrow space to the really best and brightest and high quality specialists in a narrow network that's consistent with plan design that an employer built or a community health system whose 70% of their um, pa patients come from people we have no control over. We're all trying to do this leakage keepage thing. And in Philadelphia, in particular, um, our approach on physician comp um, has been um, you know, complicated by lots of focus on fair market value and, and what fits in fair market value and start any kickback, whether you're, whether you're independent or employed. And so we all got very energized around this construct when we developed the IPEs, these independent provider entities, where we were going to do this pay for value stuff with, uh, with IBC. And how do we get the money to the docs? And does the money go to the doctor company? Because, woohoo, you know, that pays for the kind of corporate overhead or the infrastructure. Do we get that money down to the practice? Um, does it really actually go to the doctor in the practice? Because if we were all members of the practice and and Tony was the star and we were not the stars. Does he get it in his paycheck? And does this count to fair market value? Um, is this part of the gig? And we know nationally the primary care doctors can get multipliers of their salary, like whole multipliers, not like tens and twenty thousands, based on working in very mature risk markets. And so one of the things we will grapple with, whether it's independence employed or in arrangements like Tandine, is how do we move the physician compensation structure how do we force the payers to not pay doctors quality incentives through cap payments and those kinds of things so we can make that engagement go up and the leakage go down because truth be told leakage isn't going to go we aren't going to narrow that leakage unless there is a financial incentive for literally changing how they get up in the morning 
get nervous, she points at me every time she says leakage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I don't know you're coming at me. <laughs> I got my eyes on you. <laughs> I think I need to keep control of <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to just uh, maybe just cover a couple more. We have about 10 more minutes before um, we, we uh, change uh, gears here. Just maybe a couple of details around, you know, you, you had mentioned just uh, getting the care management team in place and finding the talent. And I guess just maybe starting with you, just the challenges around, uh, you know, building the organization, getting the right talent in the right places as you're, you know, doing something new here, you know, what, what have you run into or, you know, like lessons learned from this process? Right, well, I think lessons learned again and again is don't bite off too much initially. That's the first lesson learned, but don't seem to learn that, seem to keep doing that. <laughs> um, the, uh, and it, we probably all have a little different idea of what, what a care management team looks like, how many nurses, how many health coaches, etc. cetera. Um, we've, we, we, Noble have experienced uh, some trouble finding really uh, well-qualified nurse care managers, health coaches, uh, which I thought would actually be the tougher thing to find. Um, I, we're finding some very well-trained, motivated, uh, really strong customer service people who will be great health coaches, but having some trouble on the RN, the nurse side. Um, and a lot of uh, nurse care managers are either with payers, um, and that's one model, but not our model, or inpatient, largely inpatient based, and that's also not our model. So we've had some trouble. We have about 50% of the care managers we want in place and have been at it only for a couple months, so it's, it's not been awful, but it's not coming up as fast as I would like. And then within your system, what do we want them to do? Do we want them to close gaps? Do we want them to do transitions? Do we want them to um, you know, deal with chronic disease? And the answer is all of the above, and it's just a matter of figuring out what's the best bang for your buck and where should you start. In our case, we're starting with transitions, which is not uncommon. It's extraordinarily different, difficult to find uh, to find talent, uh, especially to find talent and bring them into a uh, uh, total startup that's associated with risk because we are a startup. You know, we don't have a proven track record yet, and um, and the, on, sp specifically on the care management side, finding nurses, and and unfortunately, in, in my opinion, unfortunately, the first lane you have to pick is telephonic care management. I don't know if anybody has sat with a nurse. When they're, I mean, I, I sit with the, our nurses, we have about 10 of them now, and listen to them make calls for an hour or so. It is really, really frustrating to think that, to me, it's like we're still like the dial, it's like the dial up telephone compared to the way it should be. And, and most of these nurses uh, are very well meaning, but they're not actually trained in um, dynamic, dynamic interviewing telephonic engagement techniques. Um, and you add to that the fact that at the other end of the line, if you, t if you pick transitions of care, are these extraordinarily complicated patients who have bounced in and out of hospitals for five years in this marketplace, seen multiple different specialists who don't talk to one another, have two pages worth of medication list, 15 medications. I mean, even I know I'm a surgeon. Once you get over eight medi medications, you know, there's something's wrong. And, and the pa having these patients try and read to them over the phone with their medicine, leaving hospital, hospitals with discharge instructions that are written for a college level literacy when and many of them are, can't find their reading glasses, you know, at the other end of the phone. It's extraordinarily complicated. And keeping those nurses engaged and really jazzed about what they're doing when they're every day coming up against uh, the, a telephonic intervention you know, getting talented people who aren't always at face to face with the patients too. You know, it's a, it's very, very difficult. It's, it's, it's uh, definitely one thing that I personally underclubbed in complexity. And, and, and then once you have them, keeping them. Because, <laughs> you know, we've, we've shifted our care model three times in the first four months. Uh, because you can't reach out to every transition to care patient. You just can't. Not when you have 22,000 Medicare Advantage patients you can't make all those all those calls all the time, and um, so we've shifted uh, from some of our the things that we're doing already because you have to shift, and you just hope that they won't get to a point like, huh, you know, I let me go back to med surge nursing. At least I know my shift is over, and I know what I'm supposed to do every day. So finding the talent and keeping the talent is extraordinarily difficult. Could, maybe we can, since we're running a long time, shift to to data and just 
maybe you could speak to just, you know, what what is the, you know, gee, we got this, I'm so glad we got this, I worked hard to get this integration, and now it's there in a time for the most, the biggest frustration about what you'd like to see and just hasn't happened yet, or just, you know, speak a little bit about, you know, the promise and the, uh, the data and the frustration around, around that. And, and wow. How many people in here are data people? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if they search the stage, Tony, I want you to step up there. Um, so, so data really is um, probably the linchpin enabler that is making <coughs> our lives work one way or the other. Um, be just as new as the roles and the processes are the computer companies that are out there. Um, some are attached to the EHRs, you know, so the EHR companies say they have a pop health component. There are startups um, around the pop health component. And so I think we've all been engaged in that complicated process of evaluating technology and what technology is best. And many of those companies can be as new as what we're doing. And so there, there is um, a lack of really longevity in some of these population health kind of components. Um, we worked very hard initially in partnership with Noble and then um, on our own to really look for a platform that allows us to be multi-payer. Um, and so we, like my colleagues, are on the Lumaris platform. Now, that doesn't mean that the payers want to be on a multi-payer platform with us necessarily because this is very, very tough territory for the payers. You know, can I give you my claims data? Are you going to back extrapolate using calculus how much we pay everybody? Like, I have time for that today. Um, you know, what's it going to mean? Um, are we protecting those um, uh, statutory diagnoses that aren't supposed to come back and forth between the computer systems? And then what are we going to tell the doctors? Are we giving them yet another technology to have to use in their practice? And so the complexity of that is that for what we do at an executive level, um, a system like we have with Lumeris that is multi-payer that can do those analytics is great for us. The challenge is the next step is how do you link that in the hands of the doctor so it actually has meaning, so it works in their workflow. And when you have, um, Tony, I'm sure your practices have multiple different EHRs. I know, Susan, your guys all have multiple e different EHRs. Um, we just put some of ours up on an EHR like nine months ago. They're still like trying to get the enter, enter, send button going. Um, so that hooking it up at the physician level is really the next big challenge and how we embed that in, a work, in their workflow in a really meaningful way. And I think that's going to be the next hurdle. Anyone else want to comment on it? I would just say that, um, you know, if I think of it sequentially, uh, in, in one of the most important things we did when we started, the when we stood the company up and actually it was in some ways unbeknownst to me how important this really was and now we see it because it's not only the data, it's what you do with the data. And we, we built into our foundation documents with both of our owners and also in all the agreements that where we contract, uh, the ability to be completely transparent with the data that we have. So, so if, there, if there are entities that are considering entering into risk environments and using data, the one thing I've learned, a message that I would give at the very beginning, put in place the legal construct to share that data transparently with those that are in your network. So, for instance, in our provider agreement with the primary care doctors, we can share everything with them. They need to understand that that information that's being shared with them is confidential and it's to be used for tandem-related business, and that's their responsibility. But our intent is to show them everything. They'll see what it costs, uh, and what, and ideally, in the best in the best case scenario, the quality for something here versus there. And that cost of care piece will all those things we intend to be highly transparent with. And we'll do that with the health systems that contract with us as well because they'll be protected in this data sharing arrangement, which is really, really, really fundamentally important is protecting your ability to be transparent with the data once you have it. And then the platform is, is critical. And what I'm learning within, you know, this is not just a plug for Lumeris, but they're one of the sponsors, but uh, Jeff and I know each other well from go way back. I mean, we picked uh, Lumeris as our IT partner, as our population health platform, in part because I knew Lumeris, I saw what was happening in the marketplace, but also it, part of it was expediency. They were already integrated with IBC's claims data. That, you bring in an IT platform to integrate with a large payer's claims database takes months and months and months and millions of dollars, maybe even up to a year, and even then it's not right, you know? So a lot of that work had already been done. 
And, and so we picked the Lemurs platform. We stood it up in 140 sites now over the last four, five, six months. Um, and there are certain aspects of it that are very strong, especially on the cost of care side and on the risk coding side for Medicare Advantage. And what we're learning is, you know, we're a startup. They're, they're, they're used to servicing larger health systems and health plans. We have different needs. They're reacting to our needs, which is good. And ultimately, you'd really want that, that data platform to be uh, really a partner in what you're doing and sharing the outcomes of what you're doing, not just selling your software. And, you know, that's, that's the place we're trying to get to as we develop the relationship with Lumera. So it's a, uh, and it, it we, we, we talk about restoring uh, balance of the healthcare ecosystem, data is, data is the oxygen, you know, it's the oxygen of the, of the ecosystem, it, it's what drives it. So with about uh, five minutes left, uh, you know, we spoke earlier about the importance of culture and maybe just, uh, you know, some parting thoughts around, um, you know, the, the receptivity to, to, to really generating the culture that, that each of you are, are trying to do in your, in your organizations and, 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 you know, some of the challenges around that. I can start. Um, I think the the culture, so I, I think everybody, physicians out there, as we deal mostly with physicians, <clears throat> are interested in having the right thing happen for patients. So that's where we have to start, and that's where we, we have started. So we're at least on the same playing field there. Sandy's brought up all of the issues that physical clinicians face because Tandon's feeding them data, Noble's feeding them data, Aria's got data, and it, it's just this. So, so understanding, okay, this is complex and it is difficult, and working together to try and simplify that. We, we all chose Lumeris independently, but the reality is that it's, it's very helpful to be, to be on one platform. Um, <clears throat> continued uh, education, et cetera, is, is helpful. Where we struggle, Noble uh, has three member health systems. There's a natural <coughs> suspicion on the part of physicians, sometimes justified, of the, the health system, and I know they're, I, I they're going to hurt me somehow, I just don't know how, and trying to get around that is, is uh, a challenge. So, but I do think we're all, we are all, fundamentally rowing in the same direction and it's capitalizing on that that really allows us to move forward. So I would say, and maybe I'm just an internal optimist, but uh, one of the great things about the Philadelphia market um, is, is it are the great traditions in the market. And uh, I think there's a, I've, I've seen a great deal of respect for, for one another's cultures. So there, every organization has their own approach, their own culture, their own aura. And what, what I've seen, whether, and whether that's why the way we've rolled out Tandem or however it worked, is there's been a great deal of respect to date of, of organizational culture. Aria has this culture, Noble's growing a culture, Penn has a culture, Tandem is trying to establish a culture, the practices have their own cultures, they're all different. Every medical staff has got their own culture. I, you know, I've worked for 25 years almost exclusively at Bryn Mawr Hospital, but it became Mainline Health. We created one medical staff, you know, we had one MEC, but the medical staff themselves couldn't be any different. They couldn't be any different. And the cultures never blended, they never merged. Trying to make them all one culture is extraordinarily different because they're, it's all local. So, but respect of the culture. I think they're imbued in the healthcare system in Philadelphia is an inherent respect for the traditions that have been built here, the first hospital in the country, trained more, medical, more doctors than any other city in the country. There's an inherent, inherent respect some people would call it almost parochial because we're, we're, you know, we don't want to be embrace too much change too quickly. But to date, I think, I, to me, one of the most important factors around culture is that uh, we 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 respect one another for the cultures that have been built and the achievements that have been made, and and maybe we can really do something extraordinarily different together as opposed to apart. Yeah, I think Tony. Um Tony has um, hit the nail on the head that, you know, historically we've all kind of run our healthcare enterprises very similarly. And going forward, we're going to run them very differently, and that's okay. You know, so if we do what's in the best interest of our individual organizations and our obligations, if we put the patient in the center and we recognize that money follows quality, exactly how we get there um, is a little bit like I play golf. As long as the ball is going, 
on a forward plane. Sometimes I pick it up and throw it. Um, sometimes I play off somebody else's ball. But at some point, you get to the 18th hole and you can have a beer. Um, and I think that's going to be how this goes. It's just not going to be the same. And we got to get comfortable with that ambiguity. Um, well, I would like uh, us all to give a big round of applause to our <laughs> And uh, before we uh, open it up uh, for questions, I, I wanted to give an opportunity uh, for Ralph Muller to give uh, his comments. He's the CEO of uh, Penn's Healthcare System. Well, uh, I enjoy that. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, LDI and Wharton alumni uh, for putting this uh, uh, together. And one of the great uh, privileges of uh, working at, at Penn is the connection that our health system has with Wharton and just the kind of kind of daily fertilization we get from Dan and his colleagues and kind of sharing these kind of issues is fun of what lets us uh, go forth. So I want to thank you for, for putting this on. I also want to thank the panelists for kind of sharing the strategies. When you read about, uh, you know, um, Steve Jobs at Apple and Bill Gates at Microsoft, they would never share their strategy. So the fact that our colleagues came up here and shared their strategy, in part it tells you that uh, how much is this a strategy, or Sandy, I think, said earlier, how much is this execution is a critical question one has to ask inside of uh, healthcare. I was a little bit amused at how, how much they're all willing to take risk. And when I think about people with their pension plans, people like their pension plans when the S&P is going up 100%. They don't like it too much in 2008 and 9 when it went down 50%. So the notion that people like taking risk, uh, I, I think, I think most doctors I've worked with are more like Dan's uh, tenured professors who, who <laughs> like stability, like, like knowing that they're, they're not at risk. So it, it's kind of interesting that we, we think we're going into a, a risk-bearing um, uh, world. And those of us who are in the kind of hospital business, which I'm in, in, in part, a couple of years ago, uh, Medicare put uh, in a payment policy where they said that patients who stay in the hospital only a few days are no longer be paid as outpatients, they can be called, uh, as, as inpatients, they can be called outpatients. It has a technical jargon called observation days. We hated that. That's risk. Uh, when all of a sudden they tell you, those aren't inpatients anymore. You've got to figure out how to change the care pattern to make them outpatients, as far as I can tell. Very few places have figured that out. So I do think there's a lot of you know, agreement that we want to go more towards uh, value and uh, who's against value, who's against stability in the Middle East. But I think actually how to get there is a whole other, uh, is a whole other uh, question. So I, have, I think some of the questions that I have, and I think it came through, and I enjoyed the, the conversation has evolved. You started seeing some differences in how uh, Sandy and Susan and, and Tony were approaching this. I think you have to think about how, how you think uh, medicine really changes. Uh, I remember in the 90s, I was uh, obviously around well before the 90s, but when the big managed care uh, revolution came in around the country, uh, in some ways, as I've told some of my colleagues at Penn, you had to then decide, were you in the bed filling business or bed emptying business? And what happened, especially in California and up in the Midwest, is you had these big primary care groups, some successful, some not, who really brought utilization rates down. As Tony pointed out, uh, utilization in, uh, in Philadelphia and really a everywhere from Boston down to Baltimore runs anywhere from 30 to 40 percent higher than it does out in, in Portland or Seattle or, or uh, you know, the upper Midwest like Minneapolis and, and, and Minnesota. Some of us think that has a lot to do uh, with the underlying demographics, as I've said in different settings. We're the land of cheesesteaks and they're the land of tofu. And that tells you something. <laughs> it tells you something about the underlying demography, uh, but also has to do with how, as Sandy said, physicians are organized. So if you think the key to uh, changing medicine is how to organize primary care physicians, which is what uh, uh, Tony's doing, whether you think you really have to have specialists organized uh, in a different way, whether you think you can really do it only around group practices, that are integrated, and in many of the great examples around the country, you know, the Kaisers, the health partners up in, in Minneapolis, so you look at the, all the kind of successes to Harvard a Community Health Plan, Harvard Pilgrim, and so forth, those are the highest rated health plans in the country, they were built around group practices, they've been very successful, even the partners that uh, Tony has brought in uh, with DeVita, that was based around more of a primary care group in, in LA uh, called Healthcare Partners. But the people who created that created that over 25 years. They didn't slap it together in 25 days or 25 months. So how do you organize doctors? And what's your take on how you're going to do that? 
You can do it largely around primary care, around specialists, around multi-specialty groups. I think you have to come to a decision as to where you want to do that as opposed to thinking anything if it's all. And in some ways, how much you want this as an insurance company? There's some examples in the country, like Geisinger and Kaiser and Henry Ford. They're both group practices and insurance companies. Uh, some people are trying to get in the insurance business. But as I mentioned earlier about risk, they call it risk for a reason. You can go down as well as up. So uh, um, do you want to organize around insurance product as opposed to trying to do it in a more shared way, the way uh, Nova is? So how do you organize your doctors? What's your theory about how to organize them? I think is a critical question I would kind of uh, ask. One thing we didn't hear too much about today are the, the popular, you know, healthcare. I use this number often, uh, I call it one in 20 and five in 50. One percent of the American population consumes 20 percent of healthcare costs. Five percent of the population consumes 50 percent of the costs. You know, all those great you know, stories you heard in the 90s and so forth about, uh, you know, health plans would want to have their uh, sign up offices on the second or third floor to walk up. And so if you couldn't walk up, they didn't want to sign you up. Um, <laughs> so, so, so basically, you, know, you basically try to do risk selection uh, by you know, avoiding the one in 20 to five and, and 50. And it's still very true that you have to manage that population. And if you, if you can't manage those costs, you ultimately are not provide a value to healthcare. There's, a, there's not only so much you can do with a bunch of 30-year-olds uh, who are very healthy in terms of managing uh, their costs. And usually what you do in, in health prevention uh, it just advantages of people who are already healthy. Uh, but you really have to think through how you're going to manage the costs of the one in 20, the five and 50, and what are your theories about how you're going to do that. Again. The 90s experience on that is keep those people away from hospitals, keep those people away from specialists. There was a, rep, you know, there was a rebellion against that because people vote through the employers and at the uh, ballot box to say, I don't want my care that managed. But the question is how to manage that in a more effective way than just keeping away from doctors and hospitals is a critical challenge that our colleagues here, I think, are trying to structure. Um, I was once trained as a social scientist, so uh, Dan is trained as an economist, and I was trained as a political scientist and economist. So one of the questions I was asked is, is around governance. Who makes decisions? So the question that San I think Sandy or Susan raised is, how do you divide the money? Who makes the decisions? The critical questions. And uh, you know, for example, uh, when I was, before I came to Penn, I was at the University of Chicago, and this was in the 90s, and one of the things we did, we got into insurance business as well as the kind of delivery uh, business. And uh, we, we ran a, a big HMO, and uh, you know we, we kept the payments down to our doctors, and our doctors came to me every day. He said, look, you're both a hospital executive and a managed care executive. Why don't you pay me more? Uh, you know, why don't you pay me the way Blue Cross pays me? And I said, this is all the money I'm getting from the state and Medicare and so forth. So that challenge of you know, how you assign uh, payments and whether you want inside an organization to be the kind of transfer price expert to make, move money back and forth is a critical question. So I, I, I would not uh, minimize those questions. I mean, you whether it's the Middle East or following national politics in Washington, people really have different opinions about how you sign out money. You know, do you raise taxes? Do you have more expenditures and so forth? Same thing happens inside running health plans and running doctor groups. You better figure out a mechanism. And so to me, governance is critical. And if you don't have a, a, a way at the end of the day to find adjudicate who's going to make the decisions, are the decisions that you're making seen as fair decisions, and uh, can the organization survive a, a series of hard choices strikes me as critical. And most of us do not pay enough attention to how you set up an organization in the first place and how you're really going to make a decision when the going gets tough. And I think it's very important. And so one of the reasons, for example, in our health system, as we've expanded, we've made sure that we at least know how decisions can be made down the road as opposed to saying, you know, we'll get to that when we get to a tough one. I, I don't think when you start getting to the tough decisions, it's a time uh, to start uh, figuring out exactly how you're going to solve those issues. Another point you heard this today, there's a lot of variation in healthcare in America. Uh, Tony uh, uh, and others have spoken to that today. You know, the most you know, famous work around that is called the Dartmouth Atlas, which has been out there for about 20 years. And even at Penn, as you know, uh, um, and uh, Tony, they are your colleagues at IBC, right? <laughs> as, your, as Tony's colleagues at IBC tell me, you know, hop our big hospital a few blocks away, and, and Presbyterian another few blocks away, in Pennsylvania Hospital. We have uh, different practice patterns in the three hospitals, and Tony referred that that was the same case at the hospitals within Ben Moore, and I'm sure uh, Sandy sees uh, some of that at, uh, uh, at uh, Aria and, and uh, McRozier's uh, uh, system as well. 
if you have that variation inside your hospitals right now, and we have variation even within, within our hospitals and within our cardiac surgeons and within our neurosurgeons and so forth, what makes you think you're not going to have the same variation when you're working with doctors inside these plans? The notion that we're all going to move towards one kind of efficient practice just defies uh, you know, history to me. So we're still going to have variation in America, and everybody likes to be you know, a high quality at low cost. I don't see that in America. I, you get high quality at high cost. <laughs> and, uh, and you get, uh, so I, I really question, when I look at what's happening in California, you know, some of the big institutions out there that are in the forefront of having done this kind of work for 20 years, they are not low cost. Uh, so I would just challenge anybody to show me, show me where those high, even Kaiser is not low cost. Kaiser shadow price is what goes on in the rest of the market out there. So I want to see where high value, low cost is. I haven't seen it yet in this country. And uh, I think one should, you know, we, we should have a fair debate as to whether we as a society want to pay less for health care. I, by and large, see people want to pay more for health care rather than less. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, maybe when people aren't six years old uh, as members of Congress and they're all 30, they'll vote for paying less on health care. But at the moment right now, all those six-year-olds like to pay a lot more for health care, especially with the Medicare population uh, voting as, as they, they do. So I'm not against value in health care. I, I do think we should, as Dr. Gowandi argued very effectively in his New Yorker piece two weeks ago, we should think about ways of organizing care more fully. And part of what we really commit ourselves to at Penn is trying to figure that out. But I think all the issues you heard over the last hour and so it have to get answered again and to kind of summarize that then I'm going to end on, on two points you know how do you organize your doctors how do you organize care over the continuum of care you know there's inpatient care there's special care there's primary care there's home care there's, there's rehab care uh, there's more and more telemedicine though not as much for example you know Kaiser now because they own an insurance company and a primary care group and a special group 40% of their visits are telemedicine you know, I, I'll bet the number in, in Pennsylvania is less than five, maybe less than one. And why don't we uh, have, you know, this 40 percent here is one to five, because we, we don't get paid for telemedicine. And since Kaiser is their own insurer, they tell their doctors, you know, we paid you in advance. You decide what's what best way of providing care, which tells me there's still going to, um, you know, be enormous variation in how you go forth, but exactly how you integrate doctors, different settings of care like home care, uh, whether you do things at home or not, whether you do inside the hospital, that, that variation is going to continue. But you have to have a system for putting that together. So maybe I'll, I'll end on, as I say, on two points. They all agreed on the criticality of information. Um, when I ran this uh, health plan in, in the Chicago in the 90s, I unfortunately found out sometimes I got bills nine, 12 months afterwards from different hospitals. And what I thought was a good year all of a sudden turned into a not so good year. Uh, <laughs> and when all, all those MRIs and ED visits came in, and uh, I knew enough about hospital billing to know why they didn't get to me for nine, 12 months. Uh, but uh, running a healthcare system, as they're describing here, without real time information strikes me as almost impossible. So I'm glad Lou Maris is partnering with them. Part of the discussions that we at Penn have had uh, with Blue Cross and others is how we, uh, we have the big investments in Epic, like many places around the country do. We really have real time information on our patients. The claim systems, as good as they are, are going to usually lag at least a week, if not a month. So how do you wed the kind of claims based system to the kind of real-time real, real -time information that many of us have from having invested in EHRs, or electronic medical records? Strikes me as something we could really have a partnership. But I don't know how the physicians and, uh, and, and, and both the physicians and, and Sandy have, have spoken to this today. You have to give your doctors and nurses real-time information, whether it's on those 15 medications that Tony referenced, or who's in the ED, you know, as they had last week uh, when the patients came in from that tragic accident up uh, on, on the Amtrak line. You have to have that real-time information to manage this kind of care. So in the absence of that, it's not clear to me uh, just relying on claims-based systems. Unless you have an enormously um, you know, well-formed culture a la the Kaisers, I mean, you can, you can do, I'm, I'm a social scientist, you can do it through culture um, and, and training and selection, not just through information systems. But I'm very skeptical about how you kind of slap doctors together overnight. And so, so I'm very fascinated to see what Tony and his colleagues are going to be able to do to treat uh, and train doctors in new ways using information systems, using incentives, the kind of things that Dan and his colleagues teach. Um, and they've all spoken to the necessity of creating new cultures. And I think you know, creating new cultures is, is difficult work. And again, it generally happens in 25 years, not in 25 months. So it'd be interesting to see how that goes forth as, as well. And the last point um, I would just kind of make is, since we're starting here on population health, I think you have to think about um, what population you're serving. Uh, most of the hospitals in the Philadelphia area 
over 50% of their pay admissions come from the emergency room. In some ways, there's a lot, not, not a lot of continuity of care inside the emergency room, no matter how well-intentioned you are. So for most of your population, it's ED-driven, exactly. How do you manage that population over the period of time? There's been interesting work with Dr. Breno in Camden around that, and we've done some own, our own interesting work here in West Philadelphia. But uh, many patients come to the healthcare system in a very episodic way. Uh, my, my sense is uh, that the exchanges set up under uh, the Affordable Care Act are going to exacerbate rather than alleviate that. There's too many choices out there right now. So I think people are going to be ping-ponging back and forth each year based on their, um, I know, their, uh, their monthly uh, uh, premiums. Uh, even the Wharton faculty don't do a great job of calculating ex what economists teach you to do, which is what are your annual out-of-pocket out costs, which is what you should calculate rather than your premium. So as, as soon as, uh, you know, right now you have 40, 50 percent of the patients uh, bouncing back and forth in these exchanges uh, based on the premiums, which is the wrong way to buy health care. So we've just made the situation worse in the last few years. I mean, I'm a big fan of Obamacare. I'm not a big fan of how we implemented these exchanges. So I think they're just going to make life uh, more difficult for all of us inside the health care system, uh, whether it's Nobel or, or Aria or, or, or Canada. So I, I see some challenges uh, in terms of you have these new exchanges that are going to cause people to move in and out of uh, health uh, healthcare plans. You still have a healthcare system, in, at least in Pennsylvania, it's largely ED driven in terms of how hospitals get paid. So these hospitals who are going to convert into these new uh, population health managers, when they're largely ED uh, dr uh, driven, it's kind of a challenge uh, uh, as to how to do it. I think uh, the kind of good news is uh, this is a wake up call. Uh, to all of us that the American population, whether it's, uh, through Medicare or Medicaid or through employers, doesn't want to pay as much as they paid before. Now whether that's just kind of dampening the cost curve or actually bringing costs down, is, uh, it remains uh, to be seen. But we're all going to be forced uh, to have the new kind of organizational forms that you heard about over the last hour uh, today. Uh, as I said, there's been variation in, in American healthcare for a long time. There'll be variation in the future in terms of what succeeds and uh, what does not. But to me, I pay an awful lot of uh, attention to how well people execute their plans. And again, just to, to finish where I started off, I think they're very good to have shared their strategies. But what we'll see over the next year or two is how are people executing on their plans? Is it consistent? How much do they have to change those plans as they go? And then what are the results? The results are much more publicly re reported than they were before. So the, both US experts and the American population can see how we're doing. So I think it's going to be an interesting time as, in that sense, the marketplace forces us to perform in a more, in a way that's more consistent with their values. But so thanks for inviting me here today. So in, in many ways, you can see, uh, it raises as many questions as, as it answers. But the exciting thing is uh, there's a lot of uh, variation going on in how we're taking on these issues. So we'll see how these results come out. Thank you. Baseball, the, the, the home team gets the bad last, um, but this isn't baseball, so I thought I'd give you a uh, chance um, to, uh, briefly uh, if you had any um, follow-up or remarks. Well, I, the two things, I love hearing Ralph talk because uh, we've had the exchange like this before, but two, there's two sayings in surgery that I think help to provide some feedback for what he just talked about. Certainly we have two sayings. Number one, anybody could do the easy ones. Yeah. Okay. Number two, all bleeding eventually stops. <laughs> One way or the other. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, how to organize docs, how are you going to distribute the money, the governance, you know, the variation in care, um, the healthy dose of skepticism that it's just going to be more of the same old thing. It doesn't mean you don't try. And, and it really truly is in execution. You know, we, there are, these are great ideas. But at the end of the day, you have to demonstrate that they work. And, and the balance is between being incremental and cautious in the very beginning versus you know, growing and moving very rapidly and changing and executing while you go. It's, the, it's part of the challenge of the startup. But I guess my question to Ralph and the academic health systems in Philadelphia and throughout the country would be, what's the risk of waiting to see? That's the bottom line. What's the risk of waiting to see whether a Tandime can organize docs, uh, whether a community health system can, can do something terribly, terribly different? And how long do you wait uh, on the sidelines and watch and see what happens 
before something happens without you even knowing about it. I mean, I'm, I'm Ralph, I'm sure, not understands this as much as anybody in the country, probably more than most, that uh, there's risk to that too, you know, of uh, uh, disrupting yourself or waiting to see whether or not any of the stuff's really going to work because it's just more of the same stuff that it used to be anyway. And, you know, appetite for risk varies and um, risk comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Anyone else? I would only, um, bringing it down from there into the weeds a bit, totally support the comment about governance. We, we spent what I consider an enormous amount of time and money setting up governance, but even in our short lifespan, it has already paid off. It totally is a disaster to find yourself not in a good place and then be inventing the policy to go along with it. So it, I would say that even though it's a lot of time, uh, it is worth set, spending time setting that up to start with. The one thing we didn't talk about that, that Ralph um, questioned and I agree with is, you know, is there high quality, low cost, and, and how do we know? Because right now, um, I'm high quality, low cost because my rates are lower no matter what, then the, you know, if we both did gallbladder, Ralph gets more for his gallbladder than I do, so does that mean I'm higher quality, lower cost? Um, and so we really don't have cost transparency, and part of that economic um, shift that's happening <coughs> inside hospitals is really getting to understand exactly how much does it cost me to do those observation cases. I, I just looked at it, and you know, 41% of my observation patients cost me at least double what I get paid for it, you know, boom. Now how do I figure that out? And so we're really going to have to grapple with that real cost of care, regardless of tiering and how we get paid, because the more risk we take, or, or the more pay for value we take, we're forcing our rates down anyway. And so that doesn't really, it's not the same economic model when you take a look at it. So lots more work has to be done in that space as we move forward in this. Why don't we open it up for uh, questions? There's a couple of mics, and why don't we start uh, in the front with our um, representative from the Wharton Health Care Alumni Association. Uh, uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, Jeff White, class of 1985. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have an interest. It's a question on, on you're talking about value, uh, and. And I'm assuming it's some kind of cost quality equation. Is, is, that, is that correct? I mean, when you're speaking about value with the yes, no? Yes. Uh, sure. Okay. So, so I understand the cost side of kind of the equation. That's kind of easy to measure. The quality side, I'm having a little difficulty in understanding and understanding how you are connoting value from quality. So there's got to be a, a secret sauce in each of your organizations, how you're defining quality. There's got to be two or three things that are really, really important to you from a quality standpoint that is really driving that value equation. So my question to you guys is, what is that quality or quality metrics for you? All right, that's, and that's my first question. Second question I have is you're talking about bending the cost curve. Uh, help me understand what you mean by bending the cost curve and what cost curve is it so that you, you know whether or not you're actually bending the cost curve. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? I, I can start with the cost curve, only because we had some history with it. So our cost curve is just looking at our trend every year, our medical spend for employees, and it goes up by X percent a year over Noble. And we would like it to uh, make it up. If it's 9%, we'd like it the next year to be 6%, then 4 and then minus 2. So we'd like it to really come down. Again, because Crozier Keystone has was at this for a year and a half longer, and and by putting in, and unfortunately they're not all telephonic, they're a lot of hands-on, but they've actually been able to, our 2015 spend is what our 2012 was, so we have been able to bring that down. So I think that's what we're all looking for in terms of the cost curve. The quality question is harder, um, and I, I think all of us, at the, at the end of the day, we'd like a healthy population, <coughs> however we define that. How, we can't measure that out of the gate. So you start measuring process kinds of things, like we know if, if you do this, this, and this, it tends to result in a healthier patient, less hospitalization, longer life, better quality of life, 10, 15 years down the road. So we wind up measuring things that we can measure 
now that we know or believe will result in, in better health care, in better health down the road. I think, though, this metrics issue is hugely complex. It takes an inordinate amount of time to do them well, and it's still an imperfect <coughs> science. I would say we're better around primary care, but when you try to start to look at specialists and their metrics, and Tony says, we don't have a metric for the anesthesiologist saying that's the surgeon you want. We still don't have that, that metric. So it's an evolving science, but we do, we do, and we do spend, I think for all of us, I'm sure, a great deal of time trying to, what should we measure to have a healthier patient at the end of the day? So see, when, when you talk about quality and bend the cost curve, I start to choke. <laughs> I offer you my water. <laughs> uh, you know, to me, the, qual the path that Tandime has taken on the quality side is, is incredibly boring. If I hear one more thing about hemoglobin A1Cs and colonoscopy screening, just shoot me. You know, that's, I mean, we have to measure it, right? That's what all the doctors are measuring. It's the heatest measures. It works in Lumeris, you know, they, and they're getting sent it around. But it's, it's really boring, process-oriented quality stuff that, that's just everywhere. It doesn't excite me. Uh, I think we need, and we will move rapidly to uh, methods of measuring quality outcomes, you know, like not measuring the hemoglobin A1C, but how many years of eyesight do you save in diabetics when you actually manage them well and properly. Um, that's where Tandime wants to be. And uh, unfortunately, at the very beginning, we just have to embrace the typical quality metrics. I think on the, on the specialist side, what we're st starting to see very early on, and I think this is where the academic institutions and their specialists could potentially provide great value, is quality, understanding quality in the specialist world. Tandime can't do that. You could take all the claims data in the world from Lumeris and we can aggregate all the real-time data that you want. You want the, the really good, informed specialist sitting at the other side of the table and saying, you know, Tony, you want to measure outcomes on, you know, quality around hip episodes. You want a really good orthopod or groups of orthopedic surgeons saying, here's, here, look at the information that we have. Uh, this is, these are the things we think mean quality. How about you? You need that exchange to create that dynamic quality environment that we're just not in yet, right? Everybody's reluctant to share information one with the other, but the way businesses build high quality databases is even sharing with competitors. And then, so I think you're gonna see a rapid evolution of how to measure quality. Cost is getting easier, easier all the time. On betting the cost curve, when we put this business plan up at IBC, um, I had this great idea, physician-centric thing, we're gonna get all these doctors, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna bend the cost curve, and the actuaries at IBC said, really? You're gonna bend the cost curve? How are you gonna do that? Well, you know, we're gonna work together and get all this real-time information, and we're gonna do all these things. Well, no, the actuaries, which is why they do what they do, they're the, they're, they're the best in the business in the insurance industry. They're really, really brilliant people. Boring a lot of times, but really brilliant. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 Tony. Uh, you're a nice guy. We were, Dan Hoverty brought you down here. All these great ideas, that's fine. But how are you going to bend the cost curve? And the only thing that we could get them to accept for the pro forma was driving down uh, the ADK number, the emissions per thousand. That's the only metric that they would accept in a pro forma that they could bring to their to to their to the owners of the two companies and say, so we have to drive down admissions per thousand in the first year by six percent. You know, our baseline is we thought it was two seventy, real data looks like it's over three hundred on the Medicare Advantage. That we have to drive the admissions per thousand. Now there are all these other things that could lower the cost of care, site of service being a big one, right? Uh, echocardiogram at a cardiologist that's employed uh, gets a facility fee of $2,500. Uh, independent echocardiogram doc in an independent office, it's three, the site of service is $300. So there's a big delta. Uh, delta is between all these other. So site of service, if you can achieve the same quality level, uh, there's utilization, there's uh, you know pharmacy, there are all these other levers you could pull. But in the very beginning, the only metric we, that the actuaries could say, okay, $12,000 per admission, drop it by this number of admissions this kind of cost curve bend, we'll accept that as your, your pro forma, but you can't prove us, prove us that you can do anything else, which goes to really what Ralph was speaking. All these other pieces of changing behavior on cost curve gets very difficult to feed that into a, into a, into a five-year pro forma. Just to, just to kind of ground that one second, um, 
Healthcare, as you know, is one of the most heavily regulated industries out there. From the hospital perspective, we have over 2,000 metrics that we have to monitor across every possible venue we have. And in, the, in a plain old vanilla physician practice, they have a couple of hundred across meaningful use and every payer has some variation on that. And, and in summary, they come down to kind of three buckets. It's things that relate to prevention and wellness, it's utilization, how much you utilize and where you utilize it. So we'd much rather have you get your, um, your uh, PCP appointment your endoscopy at a community <coughs> hospital and your liver transplant at Ralph's place because the PCP can do quality, we can do an endoscopy, and he hits the cover off the ball of the liver transplant. It's that continuum that we mean, we mean when we talk about quality, and that's that variation that drives the cost curve, kind of in a summary. I like that Ralph's place. We should change the <laughs> 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 I think it was an Italian right. restaurant. So there's a number of hands up. Uh, I'll ask the panelists to try to keep the answers short so we can hear from everybody. But, um, and say where you're from. Uh, good morning. Uh, just on? Uh, Harris Contos. I'm from Old Cape Cod, also uh, from the MBA class of 80. I shudder to think how long ago that was. Um, my question concerns how comprehensive comprehensive care is. Specifically, is dental care considered too small and too distant a planet in the healthcare universe to merit much exploration? And therefore, it will always be a subcontractor to what's going on in mainstream healthcare. To turn the question around a little bit differently, is the structure of the industry and the workings of the dental care market considered so efficient that little reward is seen in disrupting it. Okay, I'll pay for dentistry. Well, um, <laughs> there is a... Uh, Actually, the, what you just said says, says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be smug about that, but it says a lot. Yeah, and I will also say that the um, we never pay any attention to dental health. And interestingly, the Medicaid plans for kids have sort of uh, brought this to our attention and said you're not paying enough attention, you, you know, you're not on it and it's really important. So a few more metrics, but that is in a lot of Medicaid plans now. I actually, I, I don't know, it's probably, it is undoubtedly more important than, than we give it credit for, but it's not, it's not currently on Noble's radar, not that it won't be. But. I, I, would, I would say, I mean, dentistry, um, add to that behavioral health, pediatrics, right? These are all uh, markets and business models uh, that right now aren't high up on the radar screen of disruptors because the delta isn't, and the, um, pediatrics, right? Healthy kids, they're just, it's just not, you know, the delta in pediatrics is in the same delta as trying to manage the highest risk Medicare patients to, to try and keep them healthier because, and so that, but that, what I would say, and this may sound right, it goes back to the abundance mentality, the positive deviance. If we get this right around the basic blocking and tackling, we need to be moving into behavioral health, dentistry, pediatrics, all these other realms that right now you can't, Tandon couldn't even possibly get our arms around. Thank you. John, come on, come next. Hi, John Harris. Um, class of 88, these are three classes in the 80s all asking questions. Um, uh, with Verilon Partners, also the Alumni Association. And um, I, I want to give you another swing at the bat on the quality question um, by asking it this way, which is, would you rather have your loved one cared for in the system that you're creating than the system that existed before you got started? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, there's no, there isn't any question about it. You know, it goes to the fact that when I have a loved one that needs some specific or special type of care, luckily enough, I've been 25 years in the care delivery business. I know the doctors to call. I know the people. I can help navigate them through the system to make sure they end up in the right doctor's hands. And on the other hand, I've been a CEO, CMO of a healthcare system. Uh, I, I, I worked in medical staffs, and doctors come in all shapes and sizes. Hospitals come in all shapes and sizes. 
uh, ultimately, if we can provide uh, information that makes me feel confident that my wife or my children are in in the mil in the environment that we're creating, that's where I would want them to be. Thank you. Am I on? We'll, we'll go here and then we'll go to you next. I'm Susan Sargent, um, also work in class of 75, and I'm going to clarify that say 1975. <laughs> 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 going back to your comment, Dr. Um, the behavioral health piece, I've spent my career integrating medicine and behavioral health. Um, so I'm a little my own group, which my colleagues tell me all the time. Um, Five or six of every ten patients that walk into your primary care offices have no organic reason for being there. Um, about a third of all of your medical admissions, medical admissions to your hospitals, that was documented secondary behavior. And they use 41%, they have a 41% higher 30-day readmission rate. The problem is all of their management, their badge behavioral health care is carved out. You may not see it at all. How do you handle this? So I can just tell, I'll just jump in and then, uh, because this is so much on my on my personal radar screen uh, as a CEO of the company, because I hear it and I see it all the time. I've experienced it in my own family, the challenges of behavioral health, uh, and it's just been marginalized, as you know, in many ways. So we, there's a couple, a couple and I'll be, try and be brief. We just, as of yesterday, we're on the phone with the Penn Foundation, which is out near Grandview Hospital, working on a pilot project to provide behavioral health services either in the practices, there's a big practice out there called Tri-Valley, or potentially Tandime uh, manages the warm handoff to the, the behavioral health providers, which are not just psychiatrists, they're uh, you know, skilled uh, social workers and there's a whole um, gamut of high quality behavioral health providers who could intervene. With, with, so we're, we've already started a pilot project. And the private care doctors would, are, would, are really, very, really excited about it because if we can help facilitate. The other thing is, is that inside the Mage Magellan is the network here in Philadelphia. Uh, we have now people from a company called Open Minds is, are helping us understand that there's a subset of Magellan providers who might really be willing to work in the Tandime environment. Understand that it, we want to co-manage these patients get them to the, if they need medication, get them to the right psychiatrist, uh, engage the patients in new and different ways and using the primary as part of it. So we're, we're actively looking at strategies to integrate. It's so important and it's been so marginalized uh, that to me it's a, it's a business opportunity at the same time. The, the one thing I would add, if you remember when I was talking about being on the 10 most wanted list of the um, payers and we've had to change our behavior, um, in one full risk arrangement that we have, um, the way we manage that with that payer is a joint operating committee. We meet on a monthly basis and we look at the outcomes of all of those patients, the admissions per thousand, the um, medical loss ratio, the whole nine yards. In that venue, we have been able to have them bring their mental health people as well as their complex disease people to that table so that in construct with the payer, with their mental health benefit, are looking together to manage that, that group of patients. Doesn't mean I have to personally area manage it because I happen to be at full risk. It means I have to leverage the right resources. So I do think there is different hope moving forward. Tony's comments are relevant because he's got access to that blue cross component of that benefit structure. So first and foremost, we got to understand how we work with the benefits that those patients have um, so that we can leverage their resources appropriately. And this full risk environment will allow us to create those partnerships. We just can't fight with the payer while we're doing it. That's the only way to make it work. Over in the back. Hi, my name is Arnie Tannen, and I come from New York. I won't tell you what year I graduated from college. <laughs> Around the same time Ben Franklin did. <laughs> one of the topics, or one of the issues that hasn't been addressed at all is while there are these incredible seismic changes in the world of healthcare here in Philadelphia and everywhere, there's still in healthcare competition among physicians, among groups, among hospital systems. How do I capture and get as many patients into my system so I can financially survive? We heard earlier that there's upwards of $80 million that's gonna be spent 
among the three panelists for their infrastructure to get into the world of population health management. My question is, is competition today still appropriate? And how do you justify those kinds of expenditures? You, you want to go? Oh, let's take a start. First of all, I think competition is always appropriate. So I, I wouldn't, don't think we would want to get rid of competition. And justifying those expenditures are what keep us up at, at night. Um, because we, we've now put it in, put in the infrastructure, and now we have to see that on the other end, we have healthier patients and we, we cost less. I don't think there's much question that in the Philadelphia, five county Philadelphia area, we have too many beds, we have too many hospital beds, and that, that is absolutely going to decline over time. And, um, you know, competitive forces will do that. So I, I you know, we, we've all justified to our boards why we're doing this, and we'll see in a year or two if, if that bore out. So, so additionally, I, I want to go back to something that Ralph said earlier. Um, this has to be an intentional plan. Um, none of us in the Philly market, whether you have a 15% operating margin or a negative 5% operating margin, have 20, 30, or 40 million dollars to throw around. And so when you embark on this pathway, you have to write the math down on a piece of paper and see what happens in the parentheses. And I'll give you an example. It, you know, I told you we're a $700 million community health system. You know, not all that big, but a reasonable size. I have $10 million on the table this year on pay for performance. That is incredibly material to our day's cash on hand, our ability to invest in our infrastructure. And that money I have to be able to pay for the bills of doing this and distribute enough money to the physicians um, that they've earned for, for the work they've done. So it's not just a side job, and I've seen, frankly, too many of my colleagues let this stay in the hands of the lady or the guy who manages their managed care contracts and somebody in decision support who adds the stuff up at the end when they call the case manager and say, can you check these readmissions for me? I don't know if we got a penalty or not. So if health systems are running this that way, then they have no right spending that money on what we're doing. Um, you have to have an intentional business model to understand that risk. Yeah, I'll just have to have quickly competition. If, if, if it went away, we would all be in trouble. So it has to be fostered. It's what's keeping everybody on their toes. Doctors, by nature, are competitive with one another. Like when we compared our grades, everybody knew, but even though they used a number instead of your name, you knew what your buddy's number was and whether you did better than them or not. And that type of internal peer pressure and competition is part of what we think will add to behavioral change. So some doctors will begin to react to rise to the cream of the crop be better than the others, so that's a good thing. In terms of the incremental investment, I mean, you know, a $40 million investment in a company that's disrupting um, uh, uh, an existing status quo uh, in a country that spends $8,500 per capita on healthcare and is amongst the lowest in terms of quality organized economic developed countries, a $40 million expenditure is, to me, a lot makes a lot more sense than building a $120 million new hospital or a $400 million new hospital. So people spend money on the planes that they pick. And uh, you know, this is a startup. We think, uh, and we will have to demonstrate it. But incrementally, it's a small investment based on the task that we're trying to to tackle. We have time for one more quick question. <laughs> Go here. Hi, Ralph. Um, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I have a graduate class from Wharton and 75 from nursing. And actually, you touched on some of my questions. We call this health care, but we keep talking about medicine, primary and acute care medicine. And there are seemingly invisible sectors of health care. Susan, you brought up behavioral health, which I was going to bring up, but I want to throw in there long-term supports and services, which is about to undergo earth-shattering changes in Pennsylvania, where we're going to put it in managed care. And my original question was, are you thinking about how you link what you're doing today with primary care physicians and acute and primary care with behavioral health and long-term supports and services to systems that are woefully under underfunded, not well managed, and while fewer members, we know Medicare and Medicaid duels cost more money than uh, in both the Medicare and the Medicaid populations, 
And what happens in those systems impacts how you're managing, what Ralph pointed out. You know, the, the nursing home aide who calls 911 at three in the morning and you've got an ER admission, the aides in the home who could actually be helping manage chronic diseases and um, more importantly the metrics don't make sense anymore it's not hemoglobin a1c that's going to manage that longer term population the aging population it's palliative care it's quality of life is there an advance directive so my question is are your uh, initiatives beginning to see the need to reach out and connect with that system i think all of us um, didn't comment on today, but appreciate how completely vital both long-term and post-acute care is. I mean, a huge in terms of if we're counting admissions per thousand or readmissions, even worse. But more importantly, if you're if you're counting how well the patient does, I go back to what Tony said about the dental. We we actually probably are farther ahead in general in partnering with post-acute than we are in dealing with dentistry. But, um, but and it, it's absolutely on the list and it's vital. It's just when you come out of the gate, there's only that much that you can do. I, I think it also has to do with where this mark is on that continuum to full risk. So there it's no sh shouldn't be any shock here that the three of us are started what we're doing in a commercial ACO lookalike kind of model on pay for performance. We're not pure Medicare ACOs. Um, it, it, there's a there's a different opportunity in that construct to do the kinds of things that we're doing entrepreneurially, and so when you are on pay for performance, pay for value, you know emissions, those kind of quality metrics, um, you're you're not as aware because you're not at full risk for the entire event, and it is less likely um, where you're going on the real long-term care SNF longevity piece that that's really going to come into these payer pieces where we're starting to see that as we certainly have the continuum of hospice and rehab and we're paying attention to that because we are at risk as tony is for the total cost of care when people do that because in the commonwealth they're going to flip generally out of many of these payer categories into a different kind of payer category those partnerships are coming back to us through those other entities saying i'm in a bundle payment model will you partner with me because now all you are Bravo patients have flipped to long-term care and can you partner with me differently? So you gotta, you gotta acknowledge the payer mix that we're working with and, and how those continuums pop in and out of these payer mixes. So it's, it's out there, we just didn't have enough time to get into it. Um, so in, in closing, I would just like to once again uh, thank the Wharton Healthcare Alumni Association and Lumeris for a very uh, productive uh, partnership in, in, in putting this amazing panel together and, and all the, the amazing work by the organizers that, uh, that put together such a terrific uh, uh, a session here. And then uh, finally, just to thank uh, the panelists uh, and, and Ralph for a really uh, tremendous uh, session. So thank you. Very much.